Hello, hello, everybody, uh, and welcome back to our weekly Builder Developer Investor Series, where me, Danielle Polisky brown investor agent, and my co-host, Raj Tamang, a developer and engineer in the DMV area, uh, I ask him every possible question about how to build a house you can think of, even the dumb ones, probably in particular the dumb ones, and he <laughs> yeah. as much information as possible uh, to help you learn how to be a better flipper, investor, developer, or even to build your own house. Um, so Raj, thank you again for joining me uh, on, what is it? We're on like month four, almost month five on this. We're cruising around. Yeah, it is. Time goes really fast. <laughs> okay, so today we have two topics. Uh, we're gonna finish a topic that we started a while back. Um, and then we're going to move on into interior carpentry work. But first we're going to talk about electrical inspections because there's a few of those inspections throughout the process and they're not all the same. So you have your rough in inspections, but there are other inspections. So Rob, can you tell, uh, Raj, can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I thought there was just like the one inspection <laughs> and then like a full house inspection at the end. But I am incorrect judging by <laughs> the information you've given me a little bit of. No, no, that's great. And to be honest with you, you asking all the questions, it makes me think sometimes if I just have to speak myself, I mean, me, but you're listening to me. So I think you can cast the things one or two when I'm talking. I'm trying to. That's, that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. So talking about inspection, I think when we um, discuss the framing um, and the roughing, which is electrical, plumbing, SPAC, all that, you know, part of the dock work, SPAC, all, all the roughings we do. Um, yeah. You know, then after that, you have to do inspections, right? Before you do insulation, you have to do all those roughing or framing inspections. So the, all those framing inspections and roughing, when you say roughing inspection, it, 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 usually it includes all the framing, framing inspections, uh, electrical plumbing, SBAC, right? All the dock work, anything you have to do before you close the house with drywall, right? Yeah. So, so those are the, all the inspections you do at the same time. So all those inspections, framing inspection, electrical plumbing, everything is done at the same time. Okay, same, usually the same inspector does all. Um, so one other thing I wanna say about electrical inspection is the ele electrical inspection has a two component. One is whole wiring system, right? Um, mm -hmm. To be honest, they won't be able to see it uh, and verify, to be honest with you, because at that point, there is no electricity in the house. Got it. Okay. It's yeah. just basic. Okay. Make sure all these layouts are, you know, wiring seems okay. Um, locations of the switches, all those things, very basic things only, but not mm -hmm. much because like I say, you do all of that at, at the final inspection after electricity is connected, make sure all these switches, lights, you know. Uh, outlets are working, right? That's part of the final inspection. But one of the inspections yeah. you have to do with new construction and, and, and part of electrical inspection is it's called temp for per, perm, okay? Temp for perm, which is inspection of, of the meter box. Oh, okay. okay. So typically houses these days in our area, DMB area, it's like five, 600, thousand square foot homes anyway, right? It's not too small. Um, usually you, you we, we install a four amp uh, box. So two, usually one box is two amp. So two boxes side by side, 200 amp, 200 amp and 200 amp, four boxes, uh, two boxes. And typically yeah. one one amp, one side of the box, or one box will feed some of the bigger equipment in the house. One will probably feed uh, the lightings. Okay, mm -hmm. that's how I usually do it with the two and 400 amp. And that's very common in this area. Um, so what you do again, like I say, at this point, there's no electricity connection. So we don't know if the box is working or connection is working, but at least what the inspector will look at it, make sure that the box, electrical box is properly connected or attached. Make sure all the wiring, all the grounding, one of the things they have to do is the grounding, right? We talk yeah. about that grounding um, doing concrete pouring because the grounding rod has to be embedded into the concrete footing all the way down to the basement. And that's the proper way of doing it. But in old construction, you have, you actually see um, the rods, like, you know, copper rods installed outside the house at like four feet or eight foot apart, two of them, 
Um, that's a part of the grounding, right? To, to protect from a lightning. Got it. So, and how can you figure out where, like, say you have an older house, how would you figure out where a grounding rod could be around your house? No, no, the ground, it goes from your electrical box. Oh. So you have to see that if the, from the there, yard. exactly, you will see that cable or, you know, usually copper wire connected to the box and it's going outside and there should be grounding outside visible usually. And Got it's, it. you know, usually I think like four feet long rod um, typically requires two rods about eight foot or four foot apart. I don't know, I have to go back, but at least four or eight apart. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that acts like a grounding system for the electrical. Got it. Okay. okay. But the new construction, we don't do that. We don't have to do that because we connect it to the rod all the way down to the basement footing. You're good to go. That's more even more efficient. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So, okay. So then in terms of the inspections, you've got the whole system, but that doesn't happen until the end, right? Mm -hmm. Final inspection. It has yeah. to be tested for the whole yeah. system. You have the rough in, which is just to look to make sure the connections are where they're supposed to be. The boxes are where they're anticipated being and they're in the right space and they've been doing they're correct behind the walls. Yeah. And then you have this temper temp for perm inspection for the box itself, for the meter. Correct. To make okay. sure that box is ready for power connection from outside, right? Got it. So that's what makes sure uh, they have to do. So, and the typically inspector will put a sticker on the box. Mm. So, especially in our area, Dominion or Dominion is it's Northern Virginia and DC. I think what this is a this is a different company. I I, I forgot. They're not the Dominion. Um, Pepco or something. Oh, Pepco, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they. So they, when they come in in the house to connect the power, they want to see that uh, sticker on the box, make sure that box is passed by inspection. You Got don't it. want to connect the power into the box and the whole thing is exploded. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that, that's yeah. the worst case scenario. So they will not just go ahead and connect it until they see that speaker, a sticker on, on the box or some kind of proof from the inspection. So these days they do electronic. They do a virtual, now virtual inspection is pretty much gone. There are still a few counties, they still do virtual inspections. If they do, they'll send you that sticker by text, by email. So make sure that you print it out, stick on the box. Got it. Okay, great. Okay, so the goal is to get to the sticker. Because once you yes. have the sticker, then they'll put turn on the power to the house. And once the power is on in the house, you can have that final whole system inspection to make sure all the outlets are working, everything's grounded, there's no short circuiting and yeah. when do the walls go up before the sticker or after the sticker when walls means what? the drywall yeah when do you put the drywall up before okay. or after the sticker i'm just trying right, to think yeah. about the, the success the, uh, succession there we go succession of this yeah so so that's part of your framing and roughing inspections that means now your house is ready for insulation Okay. You have to install the insulation, then call for insulation inspection, mm -hmm. and then you pass, and then go with the drywall. Got it. Okay. So the so after sticker drywall, happens, Sorry, go ahead. The sticker is happening before insulation yes. and before the walls. Correct. Before, okay. before the drywall. Correct. Yeah. It happens during roughing inspection. Got it. So when you schedule for roughing inspection, framing inspection, make sure that you also add temp for firm inspection. So the inspector know that, oh, you also have to inspect the meter box. The meter, all, and that way they can do not that Not a meter box, it's just like, you know. Separate um, not a meter box, yeah, yeah, those like panels, electrical panels, yes. Yep, okay. okay. So awesome. then, then you proceed with uh, insulation, then proceed with the drywall. So after the drywall is installed, the only thing you do is now a final inspection. That's it. Once everything is done, there is no inspection after that. Mm. Okay. So then that that's it. So that's it. <laughs> so you get the rough in, you do the insulation, you put the drywall up, and then you have your whole system and whole house inspection by the county. And then mm -hmm. any other inspections we should know about. 
Um, to electrical. I guess we should stick with electrical. Electrical. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Then now you go with the final inspection. One house is completely done. So when you do a final inspection, of course, the inspector will make sure that everything house, you know, all those electrical uh, switches are working, lights are working, hot water, cold water is working. They will check everything. HVAC is working, you know. Mm -hmm. They check everything. They're part of the final inspections. All right. Um, like There's a different one that we'll talk about this one because final inspection doesn't mean you get occupancy permit. That's a different one. I think we'll talk about that later. Because in final inspection inspections for anything, Raj. So That's what I've, I've come to the conclusion. There's like right. two inspections in this process. Correct. So you have a final inspection right. for the house, but you can still you cannot even still walk in the house or occupy the house because you have to do occupancy permit, which is another inspection. Um, yes. Occupancy permit or ROP, we call them Fairfax County ROP, residential use permit inspection, which is done after the final inspection is done and approved. And after that, then you can walk in or you can occupy the permit. Wow. Okay. Well, there is, there's a lot there, but thanks for going through the separate times where the electrical is going to get inspected. Um, yeah. It's good to know. And, and honestly, there's so many ways that could go wrong <laughs> that it's good to know that it's, it gets inspected so many times. Um, so, okay. So then let's move on to this week's topic of okay. interior carpentry work. Um, and I mean, it sounds like there might be a lot to that, but it, it can also be kind of simple, right? So what, what would you say is the most important in terms of carpentry work? So when you say carpentry work, you're talking about anything inside after drywall. Um, let's say all the cabinets, your baseboard, crown, um, if you have trims around the doors and windows inside or chair rails, interior doors, hinges, cabinets, vanities, appliances, all those are part of the interior cabinet, right? Um, so it's just that, I, I don't know, there's so much we can talk about, you know, it's, yeah, so depending on type of the house, the style of the house, your, your details uh, or shape and size of those, um, let's say baseboard or crowns would be different, even doors, the same. You know, let's say if you have a craftsman style, which is very common in this area, the area now, which I like because it's just one piece of wood. Yeah, it's very <laughs> clean, very not clean. complicated. <laughs> yeah, so which I like. These days with the simple now, people don't even like a crown, you know, just a baseboard, uh, you know, entire house. Um, around the doors and window, you could have a one by six or one by four, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the piece. Um, that That's mostly trim work. And sometimes you have to get, you know, high chair rails or box, saddle box. That's all part of the design, and it comes from your designer, if you have an in-house designer or if you have a designer involved in the project. Mm -hmm. um, that also depends on the type of the house. If you have a very traditional home, maybe you're all those, you know, trims, has to go in the same alignment, right? Same design, philosophy. Right. Same thing if it's craftsman, a simple house, very simple. Because that, you know, the if you talk to any local vendor, like say for example, Home Depot's or Edifor Lumber, Cardiff or Car Lumber, um, they will give you the catalog with all these uh, the trims. Then you pick one that goes with your design. There's so many ones. You can have two piece, three piece. Four yes. piece crowns, right? You've seen it. Um, now there's like I say on craftsman style, just one piece. Everything is one piece, which I like. Um, yeah, but it's like two or three pieces. Plus you got shoe. Yeah. Molding and like. <laughs> yeah. It's like three so pieces those things, there. those things you can do. And for example, um, you know, shoe molding, right? Usually you need a shoe molding if there's hardwood floor. But there's a way to do it. When you do it first time, some people to avoid having the shoe molding, um, mm -hmm. they usually leave a gap on the bottom of the baseboard so that you can slide in your hardwood floor underneath. Yeah. So you don't have to put a shoe molding, it would be clean, but only um, downside is down the road, if you have to replace the hardwood, yeah, a little bit, but the uh, big downfall is that down the road, I assume you have to replace the hardwood floor, then you have to rip off your baseboard, which you probably don't want it, right? Mm. You can't take it out and slide in. Yeah. So usually that's the drawback. So 
for well, me, then you have when to I do wear the nail holes and you have to repaint it in spots and like it's yeah. kind of in the butt. It is a pain, exactly. So the best way is to me, just install the baseboard, right? Um, then, you know, after you install the hardwood floor, um, install the sue molding separately. Mm -hmm. You know, the sue molding, sometimes two different designs. Sue molding can match with the baseboard, which is usually white, or it can match with the hardwood floor finishes, right? Mm -hmm. um, Nowadays, like I say, even I like because everything we try to live natural. The hardwood floor is just natural, do nothing. You know? <laughs> so. you know, I've also seen a lot of, um, which I think is coming a trend, and I think it's pretty cool looking, like six inch by one inch, very like basic uh, floor molding, right? Like base molding. But uh -huh. then the molding around the doors and windows will be painted black. So all the base molding, the door itself, the moldings around the doors and the windows, if there are any moldings around the windows, I've seen a lot of more people are leaning toward having them being black rather than white. And it's mm -hmm. kind of cool. Like if you have um, white walls or say you like have white walls and a lot of artwork like that, my wife and I, we have a lot of that. It can be quite interesting and uh, a little different. And if you ever change your mind, you can always paint it all white again. It's like no big deal. That's very true. No, you are 100% correct. I've seen many houses in this area now. They paint all. Now, painting outside trims, like trim around the doors and windows outside, mm -hmm. black is very common, you know? Oh, for they, sure. they paint it. Now they start doing inside too, especially if your windows are black inside and outside. Yeah. So you're going this black and white theme for the entire design of the house. Mm -hmm. um, then it's very common you'll see black trims or uh, painted trims inside the house. Yes. Yeah. And personally, I, think, I don't like it, but again, you know, it is, I hear it. it's, people like it. It's one of those you either love it or you hate it. I appreciate it in other people's house houses. I don't know if I'd ever switch it over into my house, but like I think it's very sleek looking. It's cool. Yeah. It's and it's it also gives a different palette for other hardware. So like doorknobs and uh, yeah. things like now. Uh, gold has been popular for a couple of years and who knows how much longer it'll be or what tones of gold or whatever. But against black, it really, really pops. And I think colored cabinets, like teals, charcoal grays, white is always pretty classic, but I think a lot of people are leaning more toward painted and colored cabinets right now and have been for maybe the last two or three years than like natural wood cabinets. Or if you go natural wood, you're not really staining it. It ends up in like a very blonde, natural, neutral tone, or maybe mm -hmm. like a slightly ashy oak. It's not that very shiny, uh, almost lacquered, <laughs> stained wood that used to be popular in like the early 2000s. Um, so we've been seeing a lot more of that and I think it's cool, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's an individual test. I have um, one of my business partner, um, I mean, he, he's in real estate investment for a long time and also he does commercial investing. Um, and we're trying to do a bigger project. He only invests in a bigger project, like multifamily project and even single family, 10, 12 homes, like at a time type of projects. What he does for fun is he does house for fun. It's a flipping. He just buy one or two house. Yeah. And he spends so much time. I, I'm sure by the time he sell, probably he's going to lose money anyway, but he doesn't need money. So, yeah. and he I have this process. houses like three, four houses in McLean right now. I'm doing tear downs and he's going in all houses, all those old houses. He's picking all those furniture, uh, some of the cabinets, all the tiles, you know, all those uh, fixtures. He's all picking up. He's a, he's a backyard is full of junk air. And, and, but he's, he's, he's having fun so much. He's picking individual pieces and like trying to put together. And he's really having fun, you know? Um, yeah, you sell. Well, not everybody buy it, but whoever will buy it, they will really appreciate uh, the time and the design and all the things thought he had put in place. It's amazing, yeah. yeah. It looks nice, yeah. It's a passion project, yeah. and that's really cool. You know that some people do art, some people draw, some people paint, some people flip houses. You know, I, I can relate to that a little more than the painting. Um, and I, I think it's cool. Why not? Everybody needs a creative outlet. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I have one of my business yeah. partner. He's younger than me. Um, he, he has invested in real estate when he's like 20. 
um, he doesn't work full time. He doesn't have full time. His wife is not working. Nobody's working. They have three kids. But what he work, what he work for fun is he does full time pottery. Or Roger, hopefully he's not listening to me. Otherwise he'll kill me. Um, but he does full time pottery for fun, you know. And he's going, Roger, you have to come down sometime. You do pottery. I said, No way, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to sit there and playing with the clay and have. But it's it's a fun, you know. Sometimes it's a passion. Yeah, why not? I think that's yeah. great. I think that's awesome. All right. Well, we digress, but back to topic. We, we did digress, but that's okay. Like that's some of the fun yeah. part here. Okay. So yeah, we talked about door. Well, well there are different types of doors also. Um, and yeah. I think the door that you invest in, especially for the look of the property, and that's not just front doors, but also interior doors um, and glass or sliding doors, things like that. Yeah. The type of them can really be indicative of the expense for that particular house, right? Like if you have a rental, you're probably not going with like a solid door, right? You're probably going to go with more of like a hollow core door or Correct. Yeah. something to that effect. But if you, this is for like, say, a personal home or you're talking a home in the I would think anywhere from maybe as little as 500,000 and up, but probably more of the 750 range and up in our neighborhoods. Um, you're probably gonna look for something that's more solid. They're more soundproof. Uh, they have a different feel when you open and close them. Like there's, it's a little heavier, it's a little more substantial. Um, so there's a lot of differences there. And there's also a big value and there could be a little bit of an expense that I think goes along with it. But what are your thoughts on doors, interior, exterior, otherwise? Yeah, um, the interior door, like you said, um, pretty much all the new homes we do is spec home in this area because this is more than million dollar homes. Actually, you know, more than 1.52 million. So you have to do solid. We do solid panel doors. Um, it could be one panel, two panel, three panel. The slab is a solid, right? It design. It comes to a different design. So talking about the front door, um, mm -hmm. so then I have a catalog here in front of me. This is a catalog for. Um, Turn our true door. See? Wait, see it. So this is yeah. the 21, 2021 catalog. You need it, right? So this yeah. door, and depending on the style of the house, so look at this one. It has a, on the top is a little bit curved. But yeah. then, then some of the ones I use, I'm already highlighted here, um, like this, you know, like like this. You could do like if you have a, um, let's say craftsman style, simple house, this is what you're gonna do. Yeah. And if, if this is what you do on the front door, make sure you do the same thing inside too, inside a solid door with the panel. Absolutely. You, said, you know? Um, 100%. So, yeah, because yeah. your front door is such an, to me, I look at the front door as an experience, right? Your front yeah. door can be a real statement of what's about to happen when you get inside the house. And even something yeah. as little as like a painting in a cool color. Like I've seen so many red doors, so many black doors, and so many, um, not just white, like like teal, aqua, lime green. Like people are painting really cool colors um, on an inexpensive door, but they yeah. made it look really cool. Like they made it stand out. Um, that's an inexpensive way to do it. But if you're yeah. talking about like a high end or a $2 million home, likely you're going to have what I refer to and could be incorrect as a door package where you have like multiple doors or uh, say two doors that open like French doors or have transom windows around the door um, that let in more light. You can really design the door to be kind of uh, an experience as you come in through an entry and it can really add a lot of value to the house. Um, yeah. the plans are not all that expensive. No, really? yeah. Maybe a couple of thousand gets you like a really impressive door and framing package that can change the entire look of a house. Um, and you can carry that through without, throughout the whole uh, look. And a lot of that can be done through color. It can be done with hardware. It can be done with windows or transoms throughout the house. Like it's, it's a cool way to add style. Like this, for, this is the first week we actually get to talk about things that are not behind a wall or under the ground or like things we want to hide later. Yeah. Like this is the fun start, the fun stuff we're starting to get into. That's what the people see it. Exactly. That's what you see it. Um, I mean, we talk about the flooring and the selection and down the road. My experience as a builder is that it's not that you have to install very expensive stuff to make this house beautiful and exotic. It's, uh, it's that how you design it. Okay, flow of the entire house. When you open the door, you start feeling like, okay, everything is connected, right? Yeah. If it's in black and white, or if you have, 
I have seen some of the houses I go in the house in the kitchen. Okay, it's a white cabinets and the black doors. Then um, your faucets are chrome. Your chandeliers are uh, pendants gold. are gold. It's all our mixed match. Okay, that's yeah. the individual design interest. But in a spec home, you completely avoid it. You have to make sure that don't put too much hot pots. So you yeah. at least do one or two black and white. Or, or things like that. That's very important. So you feel the flow starting from from the door, like you said. That's very important. When you see the front door, you should be able to see the overall design and the style of the house inside and outside, right? Absolutely. Because it directly reflects. In craftsman style, you don't. When you say craftsman, pure craftsman style, you don't see anything. You circle. Everything is square, right? Yeah. So. So then when you do the front door, make sure don't have, you don't have in like a, you know, half like an arch, on the top. an arch doorway. Um, then you go arch on the, well, and having one yeah, so that's for the different type of style. Absolutely. It's something I think has come much more back in style with homes. Like it's something that high end homes have always considered. Mm -hmm. Like it's always been a style to have your whole house essentially have a flow and a theme to it. Right. Maybe with little deviations in certain specific spots, like maybe a basement's a little bit different because it's got like sports theme or something. But for the most part, the whole home really has a flow to it. But if you look back in the 40s, 50s mm -hmm. and 60s, the way homes were built, everything was much more compartmentalized. Like each room was its own thing. And therefore, like it was not weird to have bedrooms that were completely and totally different or like your dining room mm -hmm. could be a separate, complete theme than your kitchen. And they likely were also kind of physically separated a little bit. Your living room had a theme and like they don't have to all be the same theme. Like that, that was kind of something mm -hmm. that I saw more in like a, more affordable homes, entry level homes, uh, communities like that 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 was really common and popular. Now, everyone's really trying to go for like the whole house has a flow to it. It makes things feel larger, I think, personally. Yeah, it does. Especially, like I said, um, I'm mostly a spec home builder. We do spec homes. And yeah. in the area where we build homes, like McLean Falls, House, Vienna area, it's very high end. Um, and if you don't pay attention on the floor and design, um, your house may sit on the market forever, uh, for a long time, especially the market is so hot and so much competition out there now, so many builders there. Um, you have to have your top-notch design and you know, everything, right? So that's something is maybe worth it. If you are considering as an investor doing spec homes, don't think like you are doing flip or doing renovations where um, you know, renovation is a different ball game, and also it depends where, right? If you're doing a neighborhood, your sale price is 500 to 600, that different, uh, that's a different strategy. But even the flip, you're doing where your final product price or fair market value becomes 1.2, 1.3, you still have to do good design wise inside yeah. and outside. Um, but especially in new spec homes, if you don't pay attention, um, yeah, like I say, you may suffer, right, financially and uh, carrying costs for the Big house like that could be uh, thousands of dollars per per month. Um, so oh, for yeah. me, I'd rather spend ten thousand, twenty thousand dollar more, do it right, and sell it quickly, and try to yeah. save twenty thousand dollar. Do simple, not sit in the market for two months or three months or six months. Right now, market is good, but especially in the market where we build spec homes like McLean, um, it's it's not uncommon for a house to sit in the market for six to one one year. It's in it, it normal yeah. market. Right now, it's like gone. It's not weird. If you have a good house and product, it's gone. You put it in a market, it's gone. You know? Mm -hmm. So, so, but That's again, true. it just that all the things is that, you know, ins and out, you have to, you have to consider as investors, um, real estate investors. Um, and if you're a homeowner, you're trying to build a house, make sure that you work with a builder who understands all of this game, um, ins and out, and make sure that you're comparing apple to apple. Um, mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, it's easy to say these builders are giving me only, you know, hundred thousand less than your budget. Why you're paying me more? I'm sure there's some cash to it, you know, um, you know, make oh, sure that, too. yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. with the other thing to keep in mind is like a developer builder flipper is when you're changing, say you're adjusting a house from what it currently is. Maybe you're not building all the way from stick or like completely new construction, but say you're doing it a major renovation or a cosmetic renovation. 
a lot of what buyers like a convert like a, a standard residential buyer sees when they walk into an occupied home someone living in is they can kind of look past some things where they don't maybe notice that you have a brush nickel faucet in this kit in your kitchen but you have a an iron faucet in the two bathrooms they might not notice that as much because someone else is living there and there are other things to visually distract them but when you're looking at an empty house or even mm -hmm. one that's staged, because let's be real, staged is still not lived in. Staging is a suggestion of living there. <laughs> it yeah. gives you a really good idea, but there is nothing to distract you from the differences that you can find. And there are buyers, especially like if anybody knows anything about like Tony Robbins and his like disc personality, for high C personalities, they are going to find that. I've had buyers that are like, I'm, I can't wait to see what I can find that's wrong in this house. I'm like, that is not the goal. Like, literally, <laughs> that's not how you start. You like, this is not that game. Um, <laughs> we could, we'll do that another day. We have to help you buy a property. But people, it's easier to notice when there's nothing else to distract you in an empty, vacant, and completely like clean slate house. But if somebody else is living there, certain buyers might not realize some of those tiny differences that honestly, it's not all that expensive to change a faucet. But as a, a builder, you have to understand your goal is to make the first experience of them walking into this new construction home be as impeccable as possible. And that includes things like finishes and things simply matching or colors in bedrooms and living spaces that coordinate really well and flow and make sense in that space. Like don't add red walls in places that are never going to make sense, right? Yeah. Or, or uh, I can't. Something that drives me nuts is poor lighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like see, yeah. are way too small for a space, things like that. It's all an experience. So take the opportunity for finishes, think, things like vanities. We should talk about cabinetry and vanities. They're big, bigger ticket items and buyers don't want to spend money on them. And if they walk into a house where they can tell the quality of the vanity is not the cheapest one you can get at a Home Depot, but it's a very nice vanity. Say you spend a little bit more money that will come across because guess what they're going to do. They're going to open it. They're going to, I can't tell you how many buyers I've had be like, Oh, these soft clothes and they test them. <laughs> right. Oh, wow. That's not really weird. You're talking about a lot of money. They're testing their, their cabinetry. Um, but when that soft clothes is there and the cabinets feel like real wood and they're really nicely done and the shelves are not cheap shelves, like the, they're really well put in. Um, all of that creates an experience that buyers find a lot of value in. And it doesn't mean it's expensive product. It's just finding stuff that's good quality um, and getting and putting it all together so that visually it's really impressive to someone. No, it does. It does. And especially as a real estate investor and flipper, we don't have that good reputation in in the world. You know, saying so they flippers are just like real estate agents. <laughs> I said, you're talking to a real estate agent. I get it. Yeah, right. like, builders, real estate agents, and used car salesmen. Yeah. So, that, especially flippers, you know, you know, you know, Daniel, there are good people and bad people any, in any any industry, any uh, any trades. But, you know, when it comes to real estate investors and flippers, there's not really good uh, reputation out there. So, it's very important as a local builder, as investors, to do the right thing. Okay. And mm -hmm. just, I may be starting from one project or two projects, do it at a time. One of the things I do is, okay, guys, this is not my only project in this neighborhood. Okay. Th this neighborhood is my neighborhood. Like I said before, I live here, you know, I cannot just build this house, sell to you and move, run away because I, mean, I just yeah. live down the road. My kids go to the same neighborhood and the same school that you do, your kids go. So think about this as, as in my, I'm your neighbor. Okay. But it's just um, building a house for you, for your family. But when you do that, if you don't bring that in a talk of cheap, you can say all the things. But if your quality is not there, professionalism is not there like you spoke, then, you know, then it doesn't mean nothing, right? So you can just bluff for a few months or a few couple of years. But at some point, the karma will catch you. So I think it's make sure that you do the right thing. Uh, and it, maybe it takes time, but I think people will recognize that, you know, and especially all these trims and doors and windows, the installation is very crucial because when people come in, those are the things first they notice. And 
and and also one thing I learned um, in this business for about ten years now is that staging is so important. There's two reasons. Yeah. One is that a lot of people, especially in new construction world, we have a seven eight thousand square foot, square foot home. It's so big, you know, house is big. If you don't have a staging furniture, when you open the door, it looks like big hall. You know, it's everywhere. Yeah. There's nothing. You're walking into like an empty gymnasium yeah, or a cafeteria yeah. like it doesn't feel like a house it just yeah. feels empty and void yeah. so staging will give them idea what they can actually do about this space that's what it is and another thing is that this is good or bad but you know when you build a house you have to remember it's not like it's not like writing a piece of paper you can't have 100 percent perfect right let's admit it okay it can't so this staging helps to hide some of those imperfections, you know, because when you, this is, you know, nice in a staging and, and decoration, pe people are attracted to the nicer thing and they will just not start looking at those tiny, like any cracks on the drywalls and things like that. So in yeah. a different region, we're not trying to hide anything. What I'm saying is sometimes there are things that we cannot avoid because it's construction. It's not like drawing, writing on a piece of paper. So having that staging would actually help bias to visualize the space and also not focus on those tiny things like you said some of the some of the buyer comes with some buyer come up with that you know intense notion of finding the wrong thing in the house yeah. so they may find it but hopefully not as much when you have a staging done yeah oh absolutely absolutely and there were many people that are just visual learners right so mm -hmm. For them to see a completely empty house, they're like, well, what kind of furniture do I get? What do I, how do I live here? How do I live here? It is, it is actually part of your job when you flip or build or develop a property. And unless you're developing it for someone else who's going to maybe hire a designer or is really, uh, you know, great at picking out furniture and design. But if you're flipping it to sell it as an investor uh, in whatever capacity, whatever level of flipping you're doing, it's really important to make sure that the buyer understands how they're going to live in this house. They have to understand what, why you flipped it the way you did, because if they yeah. can understand that they're immediately going to have this, like, it's very cerebral, right? Like it's very, it's like a psychological thing. When you walk into a place and the furniture is the right size and it makes sense and the spaces are like have functions that immediately you relate to, you're going to want to live there because it makes yeah. sense. Because it's yeah, it problems is. you didn't even know you had. <laughs> the house is century, you know. You live there for, for peace. You have all this trouble, you all this stress and work and running around at the house, at, at the office. So when you go home at the end of the day, you want to have a peace. You want to enjoy. You just want to sleep. Right? Absolutely. Um, and, so, and that ties into appliances that you include too. And at different price mm -hmm. points, I think different appliances. And that that's like a very vague term. But there are certain home prices that I feel dictate certain additional appliances in a house. So, for instance, like if you're getting to $2 million, you probably have two dishwashers in the kitchen. Like mm -hmm. maybe not guaranteed, depending on the location. But maybe, maybe that's more of like if you have like a seven or an 8,000 square foot house, you probably have a two dishwasher kitchen. And you probably also have a rec room that has a wet bar that also has a dishwasher and an ice maker mm -hmm. and a yeah. wine fridge. And that wine fridge can be a very of varying sizes, or probably has a second refrigerator, or um, all different types of small features that you can add into the house that make it so utilitarian. I think a lot of it is dictated by size and price point, but don't hesitate to add in small things because they really mm -hmm. make a difference to some clients, even in some houses. If you've got like an interesting shaped kitchen and you can fit, even if it's like a 12 bottle wine fridge that fits in the cabinetry somehow, you would not believe how much people appreciate little details like that. Yeah. And that's not an expensive wine fridge. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. And it looks really great. Or, or simply having a, a refrigerator that has an ice maker. Yeah, I had someone recently buy a seven hundred thousand square. Uh, sorry, a seven hundred thousand dollar house in mm. a very nice neighborhood in Alexandria, just south of Old Town, and we didn't realize because this is a it's a huge, beautiful refrigerator. It has no water spout and no ice maker. Wow! And they redid this entire kitchen. It has a walk-in closet as a pantry. It's awesome, right? 
but they didn't spend the money to run the water line to do the right, in my opinion, the right appliance for a $700,000 house. Yeah. To me, like, and they weren't like really upset, but I could tell they were disappointed. Why? Because this now changes their life. Like they're probably gonna have to buy bottled water and a little bit of, these are absolute first world problems, right? Like this is not, this is a huge privilege to even be talking about this, but at certain price points, your buyers are expecting certain things. And because we didn't realize, because they're, they competed with eight other offers on this property, no, they didn't notice the water feature in the fridge at the at the time. Yeah. But when we do our final walkthrough, they're like, what is this? Or in the same the same walkthrough, we get there for the final walkthrough, they removed a bunch of bushes in the backyard. No, that that's so true. This is a smaller thing you actually can do, and it does not cost you tons of money. Um yeah. some of the things in high end house I have seen the coffee built-in coffee bar. Um, mm -hmm. in a built in coffee machine in the, in in kitchen, it costs you about maybe twenty five to three thousand dollars, but it's so cool, you know, because you know, people oh, drink yeah. coffee anyway, you know, tea. For your it's own built in, product. yeah. And you can just have a built in coffee bar, like I said. One thing people remember, they people love baking, okay, that in general. So, about 90 percent of people, as in they love baking, if they love cooking, um, unless you know, there are people they don't like. That's a different story. That means make sure that with a high-end house, you have a double oven, you know, double instead oven. of microwave, because microwave you can buy anywhere uh, and put it on the, in the countertop. But usually when I do it, I put a double oven um, and in microwave, we put it on an island mm -hmm. and give them the option of the coffee bar. So one of the things becoming very popular these days is the spice kitchen. So it's a separate place to cook. To cook. Um, so this kitchen, the main kitchen, just to show, make like, you know, to, to yep. boil the water or something, but whole you know, cooking thing has happened in a separate room, so you don't mess up the whole house. So that's becoming very common now. Um, you know, even now with this high in the market, um, with elevator, it's very common. And to be honest with you, when you think, oh my God, it should be very expensive because usually we don't see in residential construction, but no, you don't have to spend thousands of dollars. It could be anywhere ten to twenty thousand dollars. You can have a very nice, port, uh, you know, reasonable size uh, elevator in the house. Okay. Yeah. So those are the things and options. Sometimes when I do a spec home, even if I'm not building it, even if I'm not installing the elevator, but I have a space for the elevator. So if somebody wants it, you know, I can install it easily. Things like that, you know. So. Absolutely, and truly, it changes. It changes the value perception of the house instantaneously for the person who's going to own it long-term um, and your end unit buyer. And if you're expecting to make more money, thinking little details like that add up quite a lot in the long run and you'll make a lot yeah. more money and you could really demand the very top of the market, in my opinion, if you, if you think outside that box and really personalize it and you treat it like it would be your own home. Awesome. That's well, true. Yeah. We, we talked about a lot today. This is this is yeah. <laughs> this is a very wide array. So if you have any questions about, we talked about carpentry. Um, I know we talked a little bit about cabinetry, and maybe we can dive deeper into that in a in a future live session. We can talk about different cabinetry features and things like that because I think it can really uh, that could be a whole topic in and of itself. Especially what I think buyers enjoy at different price points, like everything from spice racks to pull out drawers and island features and like vanities and bathrooms. We could totally go into that if you guys are interested. So let us know in your comments. And um, if you have any questions about anything that we went over today, especially inspections, yet again, there's so many inspections. Keep keep having those inspections. Uh, leave them down below and Raj and I will get back to you. But until next time, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, Bye, guys. Sounds good. Thank series. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.